Live from Mountain View, California, it's The Q at OpenStack Silicon Valley, brought to you by headline sponsor, Mirantis. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back. Hey, well, we're here live in Silicon Valley for OpenStack SV. This is the event in Silicon Valley for all the action for the transformation in computing in the cloud and the enterprise service providers. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and expect a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined by my co-host Jeff Frick, general manager of our CUBE Silicon Valley operations. Our next guest is Jennifer Lin, VP of product management with Juniper, formerly with Contrail Systems, which was acquired by Juniper. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. Great to see you, and uh, we have a little sports connection we just kind of put together. <laughs> it's funny, when I get dressed up, no one recognizes me, because I dress like a bum at the lacrosse games, but uh, our sons play lacrosse together. He's masquerading as a <laughs> Soccer or a lacrosse dad when yeah. he's actually a professional producer. Yeah, and, uh, I know, people don't know I have two lives. Um, but I, so I want to ask you, great to see you. Let's talk about Juniper. Obviously, total refresh over there right now. Yeah. New management team, new blood. Give us the first a taste of what's going on inside Juniper, because Juniper was sideways for about a year or so. so. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of change. We are uh, feeling really good. We got a new CEO in place, uh, Shagan Hiradpiri, who joins us uh, both as a former uh, customer, and uh, he was at many years at Verizon, um, and then at Barclays Bank. Uh, and he's really coming in with some fresh ideas about where he wants to take the company. Uh, so yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, consolidation and obviously as Contra, we haven't been long in Juniper, but uh, a lot of fresh thinking, so it's an exciting time. And what are you guys doing in Juniper right now, specifically around OpenStack? Uh, so the, the Contrail acquisition happened in December 2012. Uh, Juniper is a gold member of the OpenStack Foundation and uh, a lot of our efforts have been uh, focused around Neutron uh, within OpenStack, uh, but obviously given that the network touches a lot of different things in, in OpenStack, we've also been you know, very engaged in a lot of the efforts around Nova and uh, you know, things with storage, et cetera. So as a lot of the applications become a lot more distributed, the role of the network is interconnecting those things becomes pretty interesting. And you have an open source version of the That's product? Correct. So open Contrail, we've Apache V2 licensed uh, all of our code and uh, it obviously changes the discussion from a network perspective. Uh, traditionally, Juniper is uh, you know, a market leader in routing, switching, and security products. With Contrail, we have a pure software overlay product that uh, obviously plays natively with, with OpenStack. So I was actually close to Juniper. I was working with them uh, in 09, helped working with Pradeep. Yes. And Junos was around at the time. Is that still around or is that gone? Yeah, so Junos is still uh, the core operating system. Obviously, the, the key thing that differentiated Junos a lot uh, from its competitors uh, was the fact that it was based on you know, a BSD kernel and a real-time operating system, unlike some of the other monolithic large vent networking vendor players. So you know, it's always been driven a lot by uh, Can you repeat solid that again? Software, I, right? I love how you said that. Uh, Say that again. No, 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 no I'll do it again. Uh, that was so good. But the uh, good software, loosely coupled software architectural principles is something that I, I will say Juniper understands quite well, um, and a lot of, you know, 80% of the uh, engineers at Juniper are software engineers. Well, I remember Juniper really was the first north, south, east, west concept around the networking, pre-network virtualization. Yes. Some say took the eye off the ball on, on network virtualization. How are you guys bringing that back? What's the new update? How are you guys refreshing that area? Well, I think, yeah, network virtualization, just like server virtualization, is nothing necessarily new. If you look at IPVPNs in the wide area, we've been doing that as part of our core business for, for some time. And obviously, it scales and it interoperates with, uh, with other networking players. Um, so network virtualization is really a means to an end. As people look at things like Linux containers and Docker, you know, our network solution plays very nicely, whether there's a hypervisor or not. So it really isn't about you know, server consolidation, data center consolidation. It's really about you know, rolling out new services quickly over a pervasive IP infrastructure. And you know, one of the things that the networking industry has been really guilty of is uh, getting too low level into the details and every single flow and every byte and every packet. And I think that's what we're doing with things like OpenStack is really abstracting the network as, at a system layer um, so that essentially vendors can compete around services. Yeah, so we talk to a lot of the tech athletes out there in the networking spaces. We like to geek out into the low tech level like that. <laughs> and, and you know, Pauline Nist at Intel to folks at other companies, um, uh, and it always comes down to the network's the bottleneck. Yes. So what's going to change the game on that? Network virtualization certainly does that. Is there a unique vision that says, hey, this is the spot we got to kind of tweak, or is it just limited by physics and 
No, and I think that's a lesson that, you know, we're taking a page out of the book of the web scale players. Uh, a couple of the uh, early Contrail team uh, joined Contrail back from places like Google and Facebook where they were building out, you know, web scale architectures for very distributed applications. Um, so a lot of our new CEO's focus is around cloud and enabling analytics for cloud and using you know, everything that the network has in terms of its pervasive presence um, as an asset in that, but being much more focused around application and user policies to drive network configurations and automation. Um, and as you know, one of the things that the networking industry has done is uh, basically you get the badge of honor for having the triple certification and knowing all the esoteric CLI commands. And that obviously in something like OpenStack has forced more of a, how do you abstract various services, whether it's firewall services, load balancer services, you know, presenting a network to a specific cloud tenant so that he or she does not have to worry about BGP protocols and MPLS and all of those other things that networking folks So Jennifer, I have, to, I have to make a confession. Now that I know that you're a super network geek, I'm going to have such an awesome time with the lacrosse games. I'm not going to hang around with the, oh, Apple, the Apple guys anymore. Our, our sons play on the same yeah. uh, lacrosse team, oh. so now I'm in trouble. All I do is talk to the guys from Apple, what's going on with the watch? <laughs> now I'm going to talk about you know, NFV and... Uh, no way. You know. I yeah. become a soccer mom on the weekends. Okay, okay. all right, so we won't keep going. I will out. deny not, you know, I won't we'll even know we don't you. know each other, you yeah. know. Um, but this brings up a good question, right? So, so Neutron has been highly debated. Some are saying, you know, certainly Randy Bias has been critical of it. Yes. Uh, and others. Um, is that in the right direction? What is the state of Neutron and or other OpenStack networking suites out there? There's some startups doing some things in the area. Um, but it's a big guy's game. We had heard that earlier from Pivotal. Yep. The stack is the stack, and if you're not super funded, yep. you really can't win that right now. It's just ungettable. So you guys are heavy, heavily funded. You're a big player. Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting issues to solve, but you're right, I mean, many of the cloud builders have come to us and said the network is the bottleneck. Um, a lot of the challenges that were talked about very openly at the last OpenStack Summit with Neutron, uh, you know, we feel like we're proactively addressing. We won some, you know, very, uh, very good cloud builder deployments where they really struggled over the last two years with some of those challenges uh, that were sort of native in, in Neutron. Um, so I think we have a different approach. It caused a little bit of a discussion at, at the beginning, but I think uh, you know, the, the industry is getting much more towards this notion of a distributed router um, all the way down to the host so that we can essentially do uh, you know, much more uh, low latency, scalable, dynamic routing, uh, and, and really treat services not just with fast packet forwarding, uh, but good IP principles. You know, I kind of straddle both those worlds of network and, and applications in my, in my career, so I love the DevOps perspective because yes. born in the cloud is a great thing. If you're a straight greenfield app developer, Amazon's great. Yep. I mean, until you hit a certain scale point, then you got to stand up your own infrastructure. But at some point, DevOps and the notion of infra, uh, infrastructure as code is a great concept. Yes. Who doesn't want that, the programmable infrastructure? Now the reality is a little different, you mentioned some of the things. So where, when do we get to true infrastructure as that code? Is it going to be enabled by, or the question is, what is the disruptive enabler for that trend? Well I think if you look at a lot of the startups, they're doing this already just because they have uh, been forced to essentially do three, what was traditionally three siloed functions uh, with one DevOps admin, right? Uh, and so that sort of notion that you hear from Facebook, you know, there's one administrator for every 10,000 servers, comes a lot through automation and comes a lot in understanding how to converge compute storage and networking and higher level systems. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, we don't expect that every networking engineer of the future is a deep software developer, but I think, you know, even my 10 year old son is, is writing little Python scripts for his gaming. Um, so there, there is a certain level as we get into this next generation Minecraft. where uh, Minecraft and League of Legends and, and other things. Um, so it, it's not so esoteric in terms of being, you know, writing uh, small pieces of code to you get a job done. you give him the Python done. book? Is he learn on his own? No, no, no. There's a YouTube big Coder video. Dojo and things like that that are really fun. You know, the kids get up there, they play games and they get pizza and then they learn Python. So uh, it's it's a new world. It really is. Yeah. I know. And anything to get an edge in Minecraft, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the triple badge of honor. Yeah, I know. It really is. It's uh, yeah. good to see the little geeks growing up in Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, so what else is new? Give us the update on Juniper, uh, how's the management team, um, any big splashes you guys making? Yeah, I mean, just recently we uh, shared some news around Metafabric, which I think we're extending to think about, you know, next generation cloud architectures. That's hitting every aspect of our business, you know, routing, switching, security, and obviously with the overlay with Contrail. Uh, you know, we, we took a little bit of a, a disruptive move with Contrail. We, uh, you know, open sourced our code right off the bat as we GA'd it. Um, and that has obviously uh, accelerated a lot of the discussions around um, how does the underlay play with the overlay, um, you know, 
know, what does open source mean? You know, Open Contrail, which is the open source uh, uh, channel for us, has been an amazing route to market. We've touched a lot of uh, technology partners and customers that we probably, as traditional networking folks, wouldn't have necessarily got, you know, gotten to. Uh, you know, the DevOps teams and uh, folks, hackers, kind of just trying to understand what's going on. Uh, you know, everyone is trying to solve their own problem, and traditionally the network guys don't talk to the cloud administrators and the application teams and the DevOps guys, um, but I think we've seen a lot of that traction. Do you see a day where the overlay just becomes the fabric and no one really cares we what gear they're running? Exactly, we don't make a big distinction at, at Juniper. Uh, you know, it, it's really about building a system that works and scales, and there's some aspects that should be done in physical platforms. There's other things that make a lot of sense in an overlay, so what we've done is we, uh, you know, we are right now the only pure play network networking overlay that interoperates seamlessly with the physical network that's there. Whether it's a Juniper router, or a Cisco router, or a TriMetro router, or anything mm -hmm. else, uh, you know, this notion of a control plane that interoperates is something, is one thing that the IP industry has needed to do across the wide area, and that's how the, you know, the internet grew organically. Well, that's, that's um, why the server vendors are shaking in their boots, because yes. essentially the cloud is an overlay to a exactly. data center, so, so you're talking about a network cloud someday. And it, it's not, exactly, it, it really is about federation of domains that have to be, by nature, heterogeneous, but have to interoperate and integrate. And there's one layer which is really about you know, the TCP IP stack, there's about uh, connectivity from a network perspective, but this broader question of cloud interoperability, there's a lot of metadata that each cloud represents that is in the application layer, and that is, is you know, some and of the heavy And multi-cloud world is, you need a fabric. Yes. If you're going to be in a multi-cloud world, to get multi-tenant for a minute, multi-cloud with multi-tenants, exactly. you're talking about you need intelligence, you need software, you need compilers, exactly. you need a lot of geek stuff. Yeah, and I think it's important to not reinvent the wheel. I mean, there's a lot of goodness out there that we don't want to rip and replace. You know, when IP networks took off, we didn't say rip out your token ring and your Apple Talk and your DeckNet and your SNA. We said essentially over time, those applications will change as well, but this layer of abstraction that we have basically abstracts what kind of physical media it is, whether it's wired or wireless, or what what application is running on top. And that's a key principle that we don't want to change as we make this transition in multi-tenant data centers. Well, it's a multi-cloud world with mobile driving a lot of things. The pressure is coming from the outside into the network. It used to be the network where you get set up and you're done, do some things, but you limit the scope. Right. Now apps are coming in and dictating terms. Yeah, unfortunately it took us four generations of IP to get to 4G LTE, which is natively IP down to the handset, but we can finally run any application over any radio network, over any carrier, um, and that's what's allowed mobile applications to just explode and, and not yeah. have too constrained and I want to give uh, Juniper credit. Uh, Pradeep really had the first uh, vision on this in 2008. He wrote a great paper on mobility, apps, he really nailed it. He saw the iPhone right away. So the question I want to ask you with the whole net screen and the whole security background, Juniper has a pretty well, uh, well, well stocked set of products and security. Perimeter, perimeterless IT is a huge deal right yes, now. Yes. So t quickly sh share your thoughts on where you guys are at on that. Yeah, how does I mean, that relate to all this network stuff? I, I think if you look at what Juniper's done, uh, you know, we also no longer believe that the answer to security is a big honking firewall at the edge of your uh, data center. Um, you know, we, we now have 13 services in the security portfolio. Uh, all of them have been virtualized, whether it's DDoS or antivirus or distributed firewalls, um, you know, IPS services, et cetera. And that becomes a key service that we're using in the Contrail architecture. We create service templates for these various security services so that we can say between your you know, front end web server tier in your back end database, insert firewall as a service. We hope that it's Juniper's firewall, but if it's not, that, is, that service is exposed consistently into the OpenStack layer. Okay, great, we have some Tim, Tim Crawford, our co-host virtually. Tim, you're, you're, in, you're in the club. Tim's How working. does Juniper stand ahead, stand out ahead of Cisco and Arista? Interesting time ahead for Juniper, comment? Yeah, I mean, uh, I spent over a decade myself at, at Cisco, so I, um, you know, I think Cisco has a very different approach with, uh, obviously they have the UCS servers, they bought Whiptail for storage, they've got NCME, and uh, you know, they're doing a lot of things with, uh, with the Nexus team. Um, and I think Cisco, because of the scale and the size and the history that it has, it's taken a verticalized approach to kind of solving each component. 
I think as Juniper, we've uh, taken a much more software-driven approach from the beginning in that we don't expect that we own every single component of a architecture in the data center. Um, and we've uh, you know, had to think much more horizontally. Um, so I think that's a major differentiator for the us. fabric in particular. Not just the fabric, I mean, even Contrail. Um, you know, we see that as a loosely coupled overlay component. We are already in deployment with Arista switches or Cisco switches or Juniper switches. And that's the value of the overlay model. It, you know, we have to be agnostic to the physical underlay. Um, at the same time as Juniper, because we are very focused on keeping this you know, uh, disciplined software architecture, we can show how our solutions are better than competitor solutions across the underlay and the overlay. And we've been working very hard to make sure that we live up to this expectation of standards-based interoperability across the network infrastructure. Jennifer Lin, VP of Product Management at Juniper, the action packed. Man, Jay Shree was like that too when she came on theCUBE. She was like firing away, it was like, I'm like. I was VP of Product Management for Contrail, we'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> um, Senior Director for Contrail. Okay, okay, so Juniper. Senior Director <laughs> at Juniper, but you were a VP of Product Management at your other company. Yep. Congratulations on the, on the uh, acquisition. Um, Juniper's much. lucky to have you. Jennifer Lin here inside theCUBE. We'll be right back after this short break. Thanks very much.